Welcome back. This lecture addresses government hacking, one of the most controversial and least understood surveillance practices in the United States. The idea is that government investigators want to break into a person's computer. They might want to do that for a variety of reasons. The computer might be running anonymizing software, such that without breaking in, it isn't possible to tell whose computer it is. Or perhaps law enforcement wants to use the computer's microphone, or even its webcam, to snoop on an investigation target. Or maybe the goal is to surreptitiously take files from the computer without tipping a target off by breaking into their home or office. There isn't much transparency surrounding these practices, but at least this much is known. Some agencies of the Department of Justice, and certainly the Federal Bureau of Investigation, have teams dedicated to hacking computers. Some of the technical work also appears to involve outside contractors. There is a lot to be said about the policies surrounding government hacking, when it should be used, just how much transparency there should be, stockpiling of zero-day exploits, and more. Those are very important issues. In this lecture, though, I'm going to focus exclusively on the law. I'm also going to focus exclusively on domestic law enforcement practices. The rules are different outside the United States, and I want to put that subject on hold until we discuss foreign intelligence. Finally, I want to note that euphemisms are fairly common in this area of law. You might read about a remote access search or a network investigative technique. Those mean the same thing, government hacking. Okay, I want to move through four topics. First, I'll explain the legal status of government hacking under both statutes and the Constitution. Second, I'll highlight some difficulties associated with public computer systems. Third, it's known that the federal government has used mass hacking on occasion. I want to explain why that's allowed in very narrow circumstances. Finally, I'll touch on some difficulties determining venue, that is, which court should supervise government hacking. Let's begin with the legal status, and let's start with the obvious question. Can the government legally hack a computer? The answer, under United States law, is unambiguously yes. I am not aware of any judge or any surveillance law scholar who has taken the categorical position that law enforcement cannot hack. In fact, the rulemaking body for the federal courts is currently considering rule revisions that specifically address government hacking. Now, let me explain why this view is so widely held. Critics of United States government hacking, who do not have a legal background, sometimes ask, where's the authority for hacking? Respectfully, that's the wrong framing. As a matter of law, that's not the right way to approach this issue. Law enforcement officers have broad authority to investigate crime and to catch offenders. That includes using novel techniques without express statutory authorization. For example, in the case of United States against New York Telephone Company, the Supreme Court permitted law enforcement use of pen traps, even though the Pen Register Act wasn't yet law and wouldn't be law for nine more years. The court explained that Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41, that's the rule that governs warrants, is extraordinarily flexible. It covers all searches and seizures. That certainly includes electronic searches and seizures. So, at least under federal law, the question to ask isn't whether government hacking is allowed. Rather, the question to ask is what constrains government hacking. And there is no federal statute that prohibits government hacking. There are federal and state statutes that criminalize hacking practices, including the notorious Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but they have exceptions for law enforcement. As for computer systems that are covered by ECPA, as we've already seen, 
law enforcement access is allowed so long as it comports with the proper procedure. Turning to the Constitution, hacking a computer is a Fourth Amendment search. The usual reasoning is that hacking into a computer is like physically breaking open a closed container. Those have long been protected by the Constitution. In the terminology of the Katz test, a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy in their computer. So, the punchline to all this is that law enforcement can hack. But under the default Fourth Amendment procedure, hacking requires a warrant with probable cause and particularity. Moreover, if hacking is going to intercept real-time communication content, whether that's key presses in a messaging app or turning on the microphone, that probably requires a wiretap order under both ECPA and the Fourth Amendment. As we've already seen, a wiretap order is like a super warrant. It imposes a very demanding standard. All right, so that's the legal procedure required for government hacking. I want to once again flag particularity as a special challenge here. Once investigators are inside a computer system, how much poking around can they do? Do they have to list which files or applications they'll examine? Or can they rummage through an entire hard drive? As we saw in the context of email, courts have been sharply divided on how to apply particularity to electronic information. The very same disagreements also play out for government hacking. Okay, so there's the legal status of government hacking. Now just a quick word on government access to public computer systems. Courts have consistently ruled that law enforcement access to a public computer system, such as a public website, isn't a Fourth Amendment search. The idea is that a public system is roughly like a public space. And under well-established law, there is no constitutional privacy protection in public spaces. Using the terminology of cats, there is no reasonable expectation of privacy. So, a difficult question comes up. Where's the line between public access and hacking? Put differently, assume a computer is connected to the internet. Just how much remote tinkering with that computer can the government do before the Fourth Amendment kicks in? I don't have much of an answer for you. In the context of home computers, the courts have fairly consistently held that entering a password-protected account is a search. So, if there's some sort of password barrier that officers circumvent or disable or pass through, there's probably constitutional protection. As for software vulnerabilities in general, the state of the law is unclear. Using something very sophisticated and subtle and potentially expensive, like a zero-day exploit, would probably be a search. But something more minor, like stumbling across some inadvertent debugging messages, maybe wouldn't be a search. These issues came up in a high-profile case recently involving the founder of the Silk Road. At the time of recording, it's not quite clear whether the district court will address these questions. I would note that very similar issues have been playing out under the criminal statutes for computer hacking. The courts really just don't have a handle on what is and what isn't hacking. All right, so that's the status of public systems and the ambiguity surrounding whether the government has hacked. Now let's turn to instances of mass hacking by law enforcement. And let me explain how these cases seem to have come up so far. There's some website that's dedicated to providing illicit content. In the instances of mass hacking that have become public, that content was child pornography. And there are a number of individuals who make requests to the website. Using anonymizing software, specifically Tor, the IP addresses of those individuals are hidden from the website. And when the website is operating as usual, it just responds to those requests. Okay, so here's where the hacking comes in. Law enforcement gains control over the website, either by physically grabbing the server or by remotely breaking in. That's a search or seizure, I should note, and will ordinarily require a warrant. Then, when the users of the website 
next make requests, the responses are controlled by the government. The new responses include an exploit that enables law enforcement to run their own software. That software gathers identifying information from the device, effectively unmasking the user, and reports that information back to the government. So, in sum, the government hacks the visitors to a website so that it can identify them. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, self, what happened to the Fourth Amendment? Isn't each device hacking a search covered by the default warrant protections? Yes, absolutely. The Fourth Amendment is still there, and the same rules apply. Law enforcement needs a warrant that authorizes each search, and each search must satisfy the probable cause standard. So the question is, how can law enforcement establish probable cause when a person has just visited a website? And the answer is that child pornography is legally a special case. Under federal law, attempting to possess child pornography is a crime. So if a person knowingly goes to a website to view child pornography, they have committed a crime. And with fair probability, each hacked computer contains evidence of that crime, specifically information about a perpetrator's identity. I want to be sure to note that attempting to possess most information isn't criminal, and in fact, can't be criminal under the First Amendment. So, again, child pornography is a special case. Let's recap. Law enforcement can use mass hacking, but only in compliance with the Fourth Amendment. That requires a warrant and probable cause for each device which means mass hacking can only be used for a very unusual crime or where there are very unusual facts. This is not at all a general purpose investigative technique. Okay, that covers what I wanted to say about mass hacking. The last topic for today is venue. Put differently, where should a hacking warrant be issued? The easy cases are when the device's location is known. Under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41, the warrant should just be issued in the judicial district where the device is located. The hard cases are when the device's location is unknown. As Rule 41 is currently written, there might not be a geographic provision that allows for a warrant in that situation. Apparently, most judges that have confronted this issue have issued warrants anyway, but at least one hasn't. So, at the time of recording, the rule is actually getting changed. There are three planned revisions to Rule 41. First, a provision that expressly allows for a warrant where a device's location is concealed. That solves the problem I just mentioned. Another revision deals with warrants for multi-district botnets. The new text makes it possible, in some cases, for one warrant to cover multiple judicial districts. Finally, the revisions clarify that notice of a search is still required, but allow for flexibility in how notice is delivered. So, that's the story on venue and upcoming changes to the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. And that brings to a close the material on government hacking. In the next part of the course, we're going to discuss the procedures for compelled assistance to the government. We're going to explore the demands law enforcement might make from communication services and technology companies, as well as individuals. And we're going to work through the legal constraints on those demands.